Hey Matt. Hola, Padre Samuele. You ever, uh, you ever pray the rosary? I do. I try to pray the rosary. Okay. You made any uh, Marian pilgrimages? I haven't, but I want to so bad. Hey, on one of our last shows, I got invited to go to Lourdes. You did. You were invited so, to Lourdes, and so was I, for the record. Yeah. So but but I know. think that we should go and hang out with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, I think we that could would be do, a great thing to we do. We could do a. Do you think the diocese will pay for us to do a pilgrimage? <laughs> I doubt it. Um, but I'm I'm open to having people say, let's figure out a way. So what you're yeah. saying is the bishop won't be like, they should go to Lourdes. There's a contemporary Christian song out there that says something about how he's a way maker. Uh, that, like, Jesus is a way maker. And I know that I, song. I believe that. I, I believe I, it to be true. Yes. And so I think that's he's a, a great, way maker. And... That's a great praise and worship adoration song. Is it really? Yeah, well, I think so, because he t- it talks about, it like, if I'm remembering it correctly, it's, it's uh, you know, you are here, moving in this place. Yeah. And so when Christ is, so all make the way praise, this is a tangent, but all the praise and worship songs about Christ's presence have their best, you know, uh, setting in Eucharistic adoration. I, I believe that, for sure. All of them. Like, yeah. they, like, that's not how they're meant to, they, that's not how the writer intended it, but, oh, man. The Lord, the Lord, like he, he lined it up for us. Bam, yeah. love it, I love it. Well, we're we're doing another Marian episode today. We had the yeah. great Marlene Watkins on to talk about Lords, and, oh, and yeah. today we get to talk to Father Daniel Maria Klimek about his book for the love of Mary. Uh, for the love of Mary is available through Emmaus Road Publishing, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. He's going through just a whole Marian spirituality and how to grow in devotion to Mary, uh, not any particular devotion nor any particular apparition uh, no. simply although having, although we did talk about Medjugorje for quite some time we had a chance to talk about Medjugorje we got, had a chance to talk about St. Gemma Galgani yeah uh, so we, we, we got into Chicago some, Bulls yep and the Stigmata uh, and so there's there's a whole bunch of everything here <laughs> yeah but what we're looking at here is really what, what Mary does in drawing us closer to her son which is yeah. that's the whole key that's the key to the whole thing yeah um, I like meeting him that was fun I'm, yeah, I'm guessing that he and I episode. are probably about the same age, right? Yeah, I think he, so. He grew up in the 90s was, as a Bulls fan. I grew up in the 90s as a, as a Knicks fan. And, and so I was born in 1997. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to say that on Veritas Catholic Network? Um, <laughs> it's usually good advice for me. Yeah. So, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, for the love of Mary, Father Daniel Maria Klimek, it's a... It's a really cool book, and I'm, I'm so excited we had a chance to talk to him. Um, check it out, and uh, enjoy the show. Welcome to The Tangent, everybody. Father Sam Kachuba. My name is Matt Sparaza. We are joined. This is the first time, Matt, that we have had uh, a priest join both of us. Yes. I, I interviewed Father Mike Novajoski, yes. but I, I had to do that one solo. So this is Father Daniel Maria. You are the first priest to join both Matt yes. and myself during a, a recording of the This tangent, is the so. first time I have been outnumbered by priests. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am uniquely, uniquely honored to be the first one. <laughs> Big deal. This is great. <laughs> Father Daniel Maria Klimek, you are a uh, TOR Franciscan. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what a TOR Franciscan is? What does that mean? Sure, sure. Well, we are most uh, famously known for Franciscan University of Steubenville, uh, where we minister. Heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm actually a student there. (laughs) I'm getting my my master's online. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. My wife is a student Uh, there, too. (laughs) Oh, good. Maybe maybe I'll be an online teacher of yours one day. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, with the uh, with the Franciscan uh, TORs, TOR stands for Third Order Regular. And basically, uh, long story short, when St. Francis of Assisi um, created the Franciscans through the inspiration of grace, created the Franciscan movement, the friars who were his original followers uh, came to be known as the First Order. Um, then there was a second order, which constituted the uh, Poor Clare 
uh, nuns uh, after St. Clair of Assisi, his greatest disciple. And then the Third Order originated as a movement of lay people, which eventually uh, eventually uh, grew into a religious uh, congregation as well. And the religious congregation came to be known as the Third Order Regular of St. Francis. Mm. Okay, nice. And uh, you mentioned to us before we started recording, you're born in Chicago, spent some time in Poland, and then came back to Chicago. Uh, how did you come to the, your vocation to the priesthood? Yes, yeah. Oh, man, that's such a good question. Question, good story. So for me, um, although I grew up in a Polish American family, so being culturally Polish, we would attend mass every Sunday. Although that was a reality of my upbringing, uh, for the longest time, I didn't know whether God exists. For the longest time, I had so much skepticism. I remember I would be uh, praying before I an icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help at my home parish in Chicago. And I would be thinking to myself, am I just speaking to myself? Or is anyone there on the other side? Is anyone listening? Is, is she real? Is our Lord real? And part of my skepticism, um, it was based on the reality that I wasn't sure whether the supernatural actually exists. So I, I remember uh, I went to... Uh, undergraduate uh, college. I went to DePaul University, and I remember taking a class on the New Testaments, and I remember reading the Gospels and thinking to myself, I'm very attracted. It appeals to me, but I'm not sure whether the miracles of Jesus are real. I'm not sure whether his resurrection is real. And if the miracles aren't real, if the resurrection isn't real, then he's just another um, moral teacher like Socrates or Buddha or whomever. So for me, it was this question of, is the supernatural real? And what where the Lord really worked for, uh, worked in that regard in my life is um, through the gift of Our Lady, especially her apparitions, Marian apparitions, especially mystical phenomena. You know, growing up in Chicago, um, I was a huge uh, Michael Jordan fan, Chicago Bulls fan. And that's a mystical phenomena right there. <laughs> <laughs> Is he really human or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the mystical phenomena that is MJ. That's our Air Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you see that man fly. And I, I, I remember uh, one evening I was, or it was an afternoon. I was a kid in the 90s and we were watching a Chicago Bulls game. And I remember there was a new story um, uh, featuring a, uh, reports uh, that would be featured on the uh, news later after the game. And I remember there was one story that just touched me to the most inner core of my being like never before. I saw the footage. It was basically footage of a Marian statue, a statue of Our Lady that started weeping tears of blood, shedding tears of blood. And I was shocked to the most inner core of my being because uh, for a couple of reasons, um, as a child, um, I didn't know that such things happen, supernatural phenomena. Uh, they never taught us about such things in CCD or never preached about that mass. And then um, the second reason, if if this was real, and I sensed that it may be, then I was thinking, why is Our Lady crying? Why is she shedding tears of blood? Why is she crying in such a seemingly vivid and grotesque way? And I had no idea, but uh, that would be the path that would eventually open my heart to a much deeper faith and eventually mm. vocation. When I when I was um, a senior in college, uh, struggling with whether the miracles of Jesus are real, uh, my mother was reading a book. It was a book on the uh, reported Marian apparitions of Medjugorje. And the book was called uh, Medjugorje, The Message by Wayne Weibel. And she was really encouraging me to read this book. Uh, when I finally got my own copy, uh, she reads in Polish. I, I don't read in Polish, so I had to get my own copy. And um, 
when I got my own copy, I started reading it. And it was one of those um, awe-inspiring moments where reading a book becomes a spiritual experience. I just yeah. felt overwhelmed by the presence of God, by Our Lady's love, I, by her voice, her messages. And I was fascinated by the fact that you can have Marian apparitions in the 20th or even 21st century that are being not only taking place, but that, that are being uh, investigated by medical mm -hmm. science. You know, I, I started reading books on um, written by secular journalists who've investigated the apparitions there, who um, have studied the various uh, scientific teams, who have uh, studied the visionaries during their ecstasies, during their apparitions. I would go on to, um, uh, to a PhD program at Catholic University of America, and I would write my dissertation on the scientific studies on the Medjugorje visionaries, how they, oh, wow. yeah, how they challenge atheist thinkers like uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Sigmund Freud, and others. Dawkins, for example, he has a section in his book, The God Delusion, where he writes about Marian apparitions, and he writes about how every Marian apparition can be um, explained as either being a, um, a hallucination or a lucid dream. And I was fascinated how in Medjugorje, the visionaries through electron cephalograms and other technologies have been tested for all of these possibilities. It was shown mm. that they're not hallucinating in any way. It was shown that during their apparitions, they enter an altered state of consciousness that is hyper awake and therefore they're not dreaming. It's not lucid dreaming. And it is shown mm. that they're experiencing something during the moment of ecstasy that is scientifically unexplainable. So I was just fascinated fascinated by this. My Marian love grew. I fell in love with Our Lady. I was yeah. fascinated with how the scientific studies uh, challenged uh, such uh, prominent uh, skeptics uh, throughout the centuries. And eventually I met the TOR friars because they do seminary at Catholic University. I ah. befriended them and that friendship uh, eventually led to uh, um, to, to a process of discerning uh, religious vocation and priesthoods. I, uh, I dated uh, when I was at Catholic University, um, but still my heart was restless and the Lord was calling me to, uh, to the priestly vocation. Wow. So you were doing your PhD program as a, as a layman. That's right. I, I started as wow. a layman and then uh, uh, in discerning religious life, I, I came back and finished, uh, defended my um, d dissertation as a friar. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. All, All right. right. <laughs> wow. So then, how long have you been? Uh, how long have you been with the with the Franciscans? I um, I entered as a postulant in 2013, and then I was okay. ordained a priest uh, during uh, the highlight of uh, COVID in 2020. Oh my goodness! 2020. Yes. Wow. <laughs> what a time to be ordained. <laughs> yeah, you know, because it was a uh, COVID high time. And uh, they were so strict with social distancing. Um, and we had, um, I had um, uh, quite a few classmates. We were being ordained together that so many people were sh uh, going to show up that they had our ordination at a basketball stadium on the College of uh, St. Francis University, oh our, our other college. And I was thinking to myself, you know, growing up in Chicago in the 90s, following Michael Jordan, my dream was to grow up and become the next MJ. It never happens. How appropriate <laughs> right, that yeah. the most important <laughs> moment of my life happens on a basketball course. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I asked one of the friars who was in charge, can I wear my Jordans to the ordination? He said no. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably it's it's better for the pictures, you know, that you didn't. Yeah. But I think <laughs> that's, uh, that's 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 an understandable thing. <laughs> well, as, as as we're looking at, um, you know, you're talking about Marian apparitions. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about that Marian spirituality, not just the apparitions. I mean, those those apparitions are beautiful moments, right? And I'll come back to the apparitions later. But let's talk a little bit about what it, what it is to have a relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, especially in Catholic spirituality. Definitely, definitely. You know, it's interesting. Um, 
when it comes to Marian spirituality. Um, I encounter a number of students here at Franciscan who may want to grow in their Marian devotion. And they may emphasize to me, you know, Father, I'm, I'm praying the rosary. I've consecrated myself to Our Lady. And these are, of course, beautiful, beautiful uh, spiritual practices and disciplines. But sometimes the rosary will feel mechanical or after mm -hmm going through a book on consecration, maybe still the student doesn't feel uh, any closer to her. And so the question may become, what's missing? And the missing link is a spirituality, which I get into in one of the chapters, called uh, the presence of Mary, practicing the presence of Mary. So practicing the presence of Mary is learning how to pray to her from the heart. That it's not just about reciting the rosary, although that's incredibly important, not just about consecration. But if you're going to have an intimate relationship with her, who is your spiritual mother, you need to speak to her from the heart. You need to share with her your, your fears, your vulnerabilities, your emotions, your sufferings, your blessings, what is happening throughout the day. And one of the mm -hmm. great uh, Mariologists of the 20th century, who I quote often, uh, it's a priest named Father Emilio Newbert, who was also read, who was also uh, read by Maximilian Kolbe. He loved his Mariology. And Father Newbert wrote a book called um, Life of Union with Mary, where he talks about this presence of Mary spirituality. And he emphasizes that you can be um, a person who is either more visual or more discursive. If you are a more visual person, if meditation comes to you um, easily, images come easily, then to practice a presence of Mary spirituality is to visualize her as if she was standing right by you or as if she was walking with you if you're taking a walk or as if mm. she's sitting with you if you are on a bench. And in the midst of it, to have a dialogue of the heart, to speak to her from the heart, to encounter her as a mother. If you are a discursive person where maybe the visuals are uh, more difficult for you, it's simply about the interior dialogue. You know, I, I know a young woman who... Um, who, when she was a girl, uh, she would uh, paint with uh, colored chalk uh, on the sidewalks, just uh, draw things on the sidewalks so with colored chalk. And she would draw images of Our Lady. And then she said she would speak to Our Lady as she's drawing images of her. Hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, the beautiful simplicity of a child. There's more depth in what she's doing there than what certain Ivy League theologians may, you know, teach you in terms yeah. of Mariological discourse. She is speaking to her from the heart as a child to her mother, and she is simply yeah. living you know, under her it, presence. It's interesting you're, you're bringing up that idea of, of that even, real even simplicity. How, yeah, yeah, simplicity of a child, beautiful, holy simplicity. Sometimes it's the simplicity of a child that is so disposed to holiness um, that we can learn so much. And I was thinking to myself, even um, if you consider some of the visionaries, uh, so for example, the... Um, first um, approved Marian apparition uh, of the on the African continent is the apparitions of Kibeho, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And when you consider how the visionaries of Kibeho refer to Our Lady, um, the language at first scandalized some people because it was so affectionate. You know, one of the Kibeho visionaries speaking to Our Lady, she would say, my love, my darling, my dear mom. Mm. And, and some of the people would ask them afterwards, the visionaries, how dare you? How dare you speak so affectionately to the mother of gods? And the visionary said, she, she wants us to speak to her that way because she wants us to understand that she's not our boss or our principal. She's our mom. And I'm thinking, yes. 
Yes, do not be afraid. Yeah. Do not be afraid to speak to her with more affectionate terminology, a more affectionate title. Call her my, call her mom, call her my beloved, my dear. Allow, allow those words just to flow out of your spirit, especially because you're baptized. The Holy Spirit mm-hmm. lives within you. He is the spouse of Our Lady. Allow Him to speak beautiful, romantic words to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was visiting a priest friend of mine, and he, um, He's he's a pretty erudite guy. He's got, I mean, if you if you walk into his office, you just see books everywhere, and he's got these these paintings that people have given to him over the years, and they're these, if if they're not originals, they're they're reprints of of just some of the finest of classical art. He's got beautiful icons, and he said, I want to show you my favorite thing though, and he brought me to this little side table, and he had this tiny statue of the Blessed Mother, and it looked like. It looked like a one-eyed, one-armed child had painted it by number using the wrong paint. <laughs> um, it was, it was, it was just like somebody who had no idea what they were doing had made this thing, and it was not especially beautiful in the in the classical sense at all. The colors didn't quite make any <laughs> sense, and it was just it was this strange thing. And he said, "This is my favorite thing." I said, "Why is this your favorite?" And he said, because I know that this was made with so much devotion mm-hmm. and so much love, and it's not one of these things that somebody paid a lot of money for. Yeah. Um, in fact, I know where this came from. It came from this this village, and I don't remember what country it was, but he had gone there once as as part of a pilgrimage. Uh, they they spent some time doing some mission work or something. And he said, this is the, my favorite thing, because this is what they gave me. And it's this, this beautiful little statue of the Blessed Mother that... If you looked at it at first, you'd say this is the tackiest thing, or this is this is not really very special. But then he was bringing it into that dimension of Marian spirituality that's so so much about simplicity and being a child, right? Yes, you know. Yeah, and so yeah. Mary unlocks, I think, in a real way for us that childish, childlike approach, not childish. That's the wrong yes. word. But that childlike approach to to God. Definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah. And sometimes, you know, we have. As a spiritual director, I know that there are so many souls who, because of their own father wounds, may struggle with relating to God the Father. And there's something about Our Lady as the gentle mother who becomes that intercessor that can bring them into an encounter with the Lord that is more conducive to where they are that is more um, maternal, something that they need. So she becomes uh, quite quite the vessel of grace. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I know that uh, the... So, so I... I think it was two years ago now. I I don't know if it was a mystical experience. I want to just like bounce something off you. I want your opinion. I, need, sure, I want you to solve sure. all my problems for me. Um, <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I, I had this. We're twenty experience. minutes in, Matt, so we don't we don't have that much time. <laughs> yeah, okay? yeah. Like, make, make this quick, you know. <laughs> I, I had this experience where um, I was working at a school named Mater Salvatoris, um, and they're an Ignatian order, right? So, uh, or or perhaps they just have an Ignatian spirituality. That's probably a better way of saying it. Um, but th- this is how this experience went. I was in a lot of pain at the time. Um, and I, I couldn't like really put my finger on it. Like I just, I just for some reason it wasn't coming to the forefront. And I walked by this really beautiful statue of Mary um, on the way into work at this school. And it was like I was filled with like a crippling pain as I walked by this statue. Um, and I ended up talking to one of the sisters about this. Um, and and essentially. What what this sister said to me was, Mary is showing you the pain that you have inside of you. She also told me that she knew me that she knew I was in pain from the very first time I met her. So that was you know fun. Um, but but essentially, <laughs> I hate it when nuns read your soul. Yeah, yeah. It was it was. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> but uh, essentially, she ended up to, to shorten the story. She ended up telling me that I needed to go back. And find where Mary was in the moments of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sounds a lot like this Marian spirituality, um, mm-hmm. where you, you're, you're practicing that presence. So in terms of 
because moving forward, you're saying, you know, you know, if you're on a bench, see her on the bench. If you're playing basketball, I'm sure she's great at it. You know what I mean? Keep going. Um, but how do you see her in the past? Yeah. How do you yeah, see a guiding yeah. hand is, I guess, what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And before I answer that, Mag, can I first ask a follow-up follow up question <laughs> about your uh, experience? Sure. Uh, when you felt that intense pain, was it in any particular part of the yeah, body? Yeah, it was in my chest. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, at, at first I, I ended up going to confession that day because I thought it was, I thought it was like a pain from a sin that I didn't realize I had or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I spent I spent time in the chapel that that same day, and in the chapel, uh, said to the, our Lord in the tabernacle, "All right, if you want me to talk to Sister Noah, I will." And then I basically ran into her on the way out the door. Like I like I, I don't think I I wasn't that close to knocking her over, but I was moving pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 When you knock over nuns, Jesus gets really upset. Yeah. Just yeah. so we're clear. Yes. Right? Yeah, and that is like why that. I don't do it. Uh, yeah. No, it's a good move. Yeah. Good move. Yeah. And you know, it's it's interesting that you say the chest because of course uh one of the great Marian prophecies is uh Simeon saying to our lady and a sword shall pierce your heart as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. One of uh, one of the joys that I experience as a spiritual director is um, I have a lot of people come to me. I, I, I almost noticed it as a type of vocation within a vocation where I've had, I've had a number of people come to me who have um, some type of very unique mystical phenomena in their lives. Mm. And I've actually met um, in the past two years a number of stigmatics, you know, and it's okay. it's actually a phenomena that's much more common in the invisible variation. So in invisible stigmata. So I've, I've met, um, uh, for example, uh, young women who have had the pains um, actually in their hearts and extending from the hearts into the hands and the feet and even the crown. Uh, w one young woman who I'm very close to uh, had a very strong experience of the passion this past Good Friday. Um, and it was an experience where um, not only was it intense pain in the crown um, in the head area and in her hands, feet and sides, but also um, a type of interior spiritual um, participation in Our Lady's sorrow, mm. where she was able to feel Our Lady's pain at seeing her son crucified. And she said that was the most unbearable part, the feeling of you have to see him suffer and there's nothing that you can do. You're absolutely helpless in the midst mm. of it. But I've noticed that sometimes Sometimes people can have experiences, mm -hmm. even brief experiences like you had, Matt, where there's some kind of participation of pain. And the Lord communicates through the body, including pain in the body. And um, at times it is um, Our Lady expressing her sorrow. It may be the Lord Jesus expressing his own interior sorrow. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing anything wrong, but it can mean that you're called to a type of uh, spirituality of reparation, communing with them, communing in their sorrow, praying for consolation to mm. the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Hearts. And perhaps sometimes even the pain is offered for for sinners, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, he uses souls and even their bodily sufferings to be able to uh, release graces into the world. And one of, one of the chapters that I have in, in my book, um, it's actually a chapter that gets into this rare phenomena. It's called um, the Stigmata of Mary, uh, because there have been a couple of uh, mystics in the tradition who have reported uh, one of them is the uh, Venerable Maria of Agreda, the Spanish mystic who had visions of the life of Our Lady leading to the multi-volume work, the mystical city of gods. 
And in that work, in the passion narratives, Maria Vagreda, uh, her visions portray Our Lady as making a special request to God the Father on Holy Thursday of, um, of the first Passion Week, Holy, the first Holy Week. Um, the request was, Father, allow me to suffer with him. Allow me to feel the pains in my body. Take away all consolation. Allow me to feel the spiritual desolation. Because, Father, it would be more painful for me to see him suffer alone than to have the grace, the gift of suffering with him. And according to Maria Vagreda and according to other mystics as well, Our Lady received this grace of interior stigmata during the Passion, that she Mm. felt his wounds, that she was the first stigmatic. And what's interesting is when you study St. John of the Cross as the mystical doctor, um, he has a section in his writings where he speaks about stigmata. And he he writes about how often it originates Uh, from the hearts, beginning as a wound of love in the hearts, this type of piercing, yearning of the heart for Jesus and to suffer with Jesus. And from the heart, it can eventually extend to the hands, feet, side, uh, other parts of the body. And if you think about it that way, that it begins as a wound of love in the hearts, then Simeon's prophecy that a sword shall pierce your hearts has even greater multi-layered value that it may have been a prophetic uh, anticipation of her uh, potential stigmata during the Lord's Passion. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know... It- Did he fix you, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I've, I've had the thought quite often about... Um, I'm, I, I, I'm, this is, I, I want this to come off the correct way. Um, I've thought about the stigmata a lot. Um, I think it's cause it's just such an undeniable motive of credibility. You know, like I, I don't know how someone could see someone like Padre Pio with the stigmata and be like, yeah, he probably just cut his own hands. You know what I mean? That like that doesn't <laughs> right, right. that doesn't seem to track to me. Um, but for a long time, so I guess this is my question, right? I assumed that only priests or religious could have the stigmata. Mm. Um, I know that there's this the universal call to holiness, and sincerely. Actually, you know what? I'm probably not doing my best, but I'm probably, you know what I mean? Like I, I probably could try harder, but I'm, I think I'm trying really hard. Um, but things like that have always seemed to me 100% out of reach. That's not, that doesn't happen to a layman, you know, that doesn't married, happen to a married man, nothing like that, you know? Um, so I think more than anything, the idea that I perhaps could have a mystical experience like that is, uh, that that changes my perspective on it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's interesting because uh, if you actually think about the stigmatics of history, uh, you realize that very few of them have been priests. Hmm. Uh, many of them have been uh, women, and um, and I- including lay women. Um, even here in Ohio, there's a famous American stigmatic. Or her home uh, in Canton, Ohio, Rhoda Weiss. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, she passed away, uh, I believe, some time ago. But um, also, yeah, throughout history, uh, so many of the stigmatics: uh, uh, Veronica Giuliani, Saint Veronica Giuliani, uh, Anne Catherine Emmerich, Saint Faustina, Saint Catherine of Siena. Uh, so many of them have been females, and I think to myself that perhaps part of it is a supernatural conformity to Christ that speaks to a spirituality of immolation, a spirituality of sharing in his victimhoods. Uh, one, one of the great stigmatics of the early 20th century was the young saint, 
Saint Gemma Galgani, mm -hmm. and I love Saint Gemma. Can you and tell me about her? Yeah, yeah. Saint Gemma was a young woman from a small town of Lucca, and uh, Italy, and she was simply someone who had such a strong interior life, such a strong um, union with the passion. She was someone who had the nickname Daughter of the Passion, and she would have experiences of stigmata. She would have experiences similar to Padre Pio of the devil and demonic attacks at night. She had such a purity about her, just such a sincere love for Jesus. She experienced a miraculous healing. Uh, she was healed of... Um, of uh, of a spinal injury, uh, completely healed. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually, um, you know, if we're sharing uh, miraculous healing to our mystical experiences, you know, I had a profound, profound um, experience of her intercession um, mm -hmm. just a, a few, a couple of months ago. It was actually uh, December 26. Um, I was driving home from Steubenville to Chicago. I was driving late at night. It was uh, empty, empty streets, you know, right after Christmas. I thought I'm going to get home safely. I got into a horrendous car accident, horrendous oh, wow. car accident. Uh, this car, I, I was driving on a 60 plus mile highway. Uh, there was a side road and this car came out of nowhere in front of me because he slid on the ice and he couldn't control it. Mm. So... I tried to swerve, but I hit him, and then my car went straight into a pole, mm. and the car was absolutely, absolutely destroyed. Um, praise God, the other driver was okay. Uh, he he came out. He he opened my car door. You know, with my car, the airbags went out. The car's absolutely wrecked, absolutely destroyed. And he's like, "Are you okay?" And I said, "I, I think so, but my back really hurts." You know. And so I got up out of the car and just intense back pains. The ambulance shows up. Uh, the ambulance takes me away. The, the man in the ambulance, one of the guys, he says to me, yep, yep, having the airbags blow up on you like that, hitting you, it's the equivalent of being punched by Mike Tyson. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and so you got ordained with Michael Jordan, and then you got punched by Mike Tyson. We're we're hitting all the yeah, 90 superstars a, today. This is great. Yeah, you are the athlete of the century. <laughs> Sp spiritual athlete with my posse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so so it was it was remarkable i'm, I'm in the hospital uh they, they they do all the tests they find that i have a uh fractured spine Oof. and uh going back to chicago my brother picked me up the accident happened somewhere in uh in uh warsaw indiana i'm polish so of course i would die in warsaw <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah so my brother picks me up from sh sh drives from chicago uh, picks me up. And when I'm in, in my family home for the first few days, intense back pains, it's difficult to bend over. It's difficult to walk. Um, and when I'm getting out of bed, it takes like three minutes to get out of beds. But um, things start happening. You know, I, I texted a bunch of friends to pray for me because of the accidents. One of my friends, who's a very uh, deeply spiritual woman who gets insights in prayer, she said, our Lady showed me, Father, that during the accidents, St. Gemma Galgani was very close to you. And she had no idea that in my pocket, I literally had a first-class relic of St. Gemma. And she had no idea that St. Gemma w was also the patron saint of spinal injuries. And before the accident happened, I, I was driving in that car and I prayed a full rosary, uh, joyful, sorrowful, uh, glorious, luminous, all the mysteries. And I felt a tangible protection. I felt Our Lady's presence. So I felt that she was involved in it too. And then three days later, I'm at a restaurant with one of my good friends in Chicago, a uh, best friend from high school. He uh, comes from a Palestinian Orthodox Christian background, but he's always flirted with skepticism and he says to me out of the blue we're not talking about my injury we're just talking about christianity and theology as we often do he says to me 
I would have to see a miraculous healing to believe in God. And so I explained to him, you know, it happens, you know, I've seen it in Catholic charismatic circles. There's a whole office in Rome, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints that investigates miraculous healings. But, but you know, hearing it is not the same. Anyways, that evening I drive back home. I'm standing in the kitchen of my uh, uh, parents' uh, house, and it took me a couple minutes to realize that all the pain has disappeared. Hmm. I literally am bending over. I'm stretching. I'm flexing. It's gone. It's absolutely gone. I I, I went to uh, m- my mother was on the phone ta- speaking to her friends. I went up to her. I whispered in her ear. I said. Jesus healed me. Look, I can stretch. I can bend over all this. She starts crying. She starts weeping. And it was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life because I've never had anything like that happen to me. And you know what I realized? The most remarkable thing about this healing to me, it was this. When the accident happens, when the pain came, I said, Lord, I'm willing to offer this to you. I offer this as a gift, this pain. In other words, I did not ask for a healing. I did not ask for a healing, but out of the goodness of his heart, the Father healed me. I'm able to celebrate Mass. I'm able to bend over to reverence the altar, no issues whatsoever. And and my friends who said he would have to see a miraculous healing, well, he got a bunch of text messages for me. Guess what happens? <laughs> and he received them very sincerely. He received them very sincerely. He knows I wouldn't lie about that sort of thing. But I found it fascinating how Our Lady was present there in the rosary. St. Gemma was present there in the relic. And my friend even uh, uh, having that insight about St. Gemma, patron saint of spinal injuries, and herself receiving a healing from a spinal injury. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Hmm. Yeah, it says God is good. God is good. Amen. Wow. That's awesome. You know, as Matt's talking about this this idea of uh, these miracles happening or these these deep calls into sharing in the passion of Christ happening uh, stereotypically maybe for, for priests and, and for religious, and then coming to that deeper understanding that, no, this this actually works on, on lots of different levels. Um, looking at Marian devotion, uh, it, what I always see is that it's it's not priests and religious who have the greatest Marian devotions. It's it's the ladies in the pew. Yeah. Um, it's it's people who are, are praying. I remember there was, there was a man... Um, a man named Bill at the parish that I grew up in, and he he carried around with him uh, this. It, it was a breviary, but it was in like an extra large case because along with his breviary, he also had every holy card that had ever been made in the history of humanity. <laughs> uh, he had several relics, a small bottle of holy water, and and then he carried his rosary in his other hand. and And this man prayed the rosary all the time. And if he ever told you that he was going to pray for you. You knew either that you were in serious trouble, uh, or or that he was very literally praying a rosary for you that day, and would probably be doing it again and again. And it was it was so great if if Bill said he would pray for you, it was, it was the most amazing thing. Mm-hmm. But that gets me thinking about the rosary itself. And so Saint Dominic introduces the rosary, but even the way that the rosary kind of came about, the development and everything that you'd have, you, you hear the stories of the monastery in the village. And when the bells rang to call the monks to prayer, the people in the in the fields who were doing the work they would pause, and they would they would pray, and they as they'd pick up little rocks and and count off ten rocks and and pray a hail mary. Since they couldn't pray the psalms with the monks, they would they would pray the hail marys, and so it was a way for the ordinary people to join with the prayer of the monks, and then over time the rosary becoming this very simple way to to pray. But what does Mary do with that? Mary, taking that simplicity of prayer, then starts to obtain those graces from her son that help these very simple people in the fields mm. to have spiritual insight and to yeah. understand something that they, they won't pick up from going to theology class, they won't pick up from reading anything because either they, they can't read or because they'll simply never have the opportunity. And then you see how that, that happens over the centuries. Up until the present day, who who is it that's that's praying, and and who has, who has deep spiritual insight and deep faith and the ability to to experience some of these things? It's it's not always the learned theologians 
very <laughs> often it's people who they pray the rosary and yes. because they pray the rosary every day this is this is what happens um you think of like father Peyton and the the rosary uh, priest right telling people the family that prays together stays together and so he encouraged the family rosary the idea that we should be praying the rosary together as a family every day and what a simple practice it's it's not that not that complicated, although I, I watch people with family sometimes, and I wonder if they're able to get the kids to sit still long enough to pray a rosary. <laughs> wow. And I've visited some families when they're having family rosary time, and, and I can tell you that sometimes it's just the parents pushing through, and you've got one kid standing on his head in the corner over here, and another kid who has fallen asleep over here, and whatever. That's all, that's all well and good. But there's something about that Marian spirituality where, where Mary teaches us something profoundly true about her son that we wouldn't pick up otherwise. Yeah, yeah, truly, truly, so well said. Yeah, you know, I, I love one of uh, St. John Paul II's great insights into the rosary. Um, he, he wrote that when you're meditating on the mysteries of the rosary, it is not simply, it is not just the historical events of the life of Jesus, uh, obviously, first and foremost, but you are also meditating on Our Lady's memories as she lived through many of these events and as mm. she is present as you pray the rosary with her. And I'm thinking to myself, that is so vital to understand because how do we go into a deeper understanding, a deeper um appreciation of the proper psychology, the proper disposition to pray the rosary. And John Paul II, for him, he said that every day I make a meeting, every day I have a scheduled meeting with the mother of God. So to see it as an encounter with this beautiful woman who loves you more than any mother can ever love you, and to see how this beautiful woman wants to encounter you every day. And one day she wants to share with you some of her most joyful memories, memories of the birth of her child, memories of Simeon's prophecy. Another day she wants to share with you some of her most sorrowful memories, memories when her child was killed in front of her. And to be able to share such memories, it takes trust, it takes vulnerability, it takes intimacy. She is offering us her intimacy and she is inviting us to contemplate the face of Christ, of her son, with her, with her maternal presence. So I think it can be such an intimate encounter. It's not just mechanical repetition of the Hail Marys, but it is a type of, I'm going to make time for my Holy Mother today, mm. and she's going to share with me some of her most cherished memories. Mm. I have a practical question. Yes. Um, oftentimes, if I... <laughs> Father Sam is cracking up at me right now. Uh, oftentimes, if I want to get through a full rosary, um, it turns into I have to say the rosary while I'm doing something else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. inevitably, it's taking concentration away from me. I'm super ADD as it is. Um, so concentration doesn't come, That's true, doesn't That's come easily true. in the first place. He is super ADD. Yeah. Um, right. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like if I want to do it well in the first place, I need to like isolate myself, you know, but if I want to get through all four, I have to say a rosary while I'm doing the dishes. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is it better for me to, let's say, is it better for me to like say two where I've I've really set the side the, the time aside, or to try and, for lack of a better way of saying it, stumble through all four, or maybe three of the four, or you know what I mean, recognizing that I'm like I usually get at, at a minimum one of one in before bed that's like really like I'm I'm able to actually sit and concentrate, um, but you know sometimes like I'm a teacher so if the kids are out at recess I will sometimes say a rosary you know while I'm watching them. And also, you know, make sure they don't kill each other and stuff. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great question. You know, um, what what I do appreciate about praying it in the midst of the busyness, in the midst of the dishes, wash, uh, watching the kids, uh, taking out the trash, mm -hmm. um, it leads to a type of rhythm of ceaseless prayer. Mm -hmm. Right. Where you realize that prayer is not simply something that needs to be reduced 
to the chapel or to your private room, mm-hmm. but something that could be carried over throughout the day. Because I, I remember years ago when I was a seminarian, um, I had one of these lents where I had maybe like five things that I was going to do. Day two, I broke all of them, you know, and I felt like such a failure, <laughs> such a disgrace to God, you know. <laughs> and, and one of my good friends was this Capuchin seminarian with a great Marian devotion. And he was such a bro, you know, and he calls me up. He's like, bro, this is what you're going to do, okay? We're going to pray the full rosary every day. We're going to get up full rosary every day. That's going to be the offering, okay, every day. I'm thinking, okay. But then I think, I'm thinking to myself, haha, you know, Let's see what I actually do it. And then the next day, he, he's he's calling me. He's like, bro, I'm on the Sorrowful Mysteries. Where are you at? Where are you at? And I'm like, dang, he's holding <laughs> me accountable. All right, I got to do this. So it was so good. I started praying the rosary as I'm taking out the trash. I started praying the rosary as I'm going to walk into school mm-hmm. and during these Monday moment, moments. And then I realized something. I realized, although... It's not always the fullest concentration, the most contemplative prayer. Right. Because I am keeping the spirit of prayer and this rhythm of ceaseless prayer going throughout the day, I noticed that when I had ministry situations, there was a deeper supernatural wisdom that was coming Mm. out of me. There was an anointing of the Holy Spirit that was speaking through me that previously was not there. And I was asking myself, where is this coming from? And then I realize it's the ceaseless prayer of the rosary right. throughout the day. So, so I, I'm a big fan of it because because I even think that that's uh, part of Padre Pio's secrets. You know, he's right. hearing confessions how many hours a day, 12, 13, however many it was. And they say he's praying 27 rosaries around the clock. Right. So obviously, as he's hearing confessions, he, he can't give his full concentration to all the mysteries. But that repetition of the Hail Marys, it does invite grace. And I think mm. it brings us to a place of uh, a very um, beautiful anointing in yeah. the presence of God. I mean, I definitely have noticed that that ceaseless prayer uh, ha- has you know been true for me, especially because in the face of temptation now, I will find if even even the thought of a temptation will pop into my head, I will find that I start saying a Hail Mary without meaning to. You mm-hmm. know, so it's like that defense yeah. is up yes. now. Uh, yes, amen. You know, as if I'm, I don't know when it wasn't, but it's been up for a while, I suppose. Um, I also have a second practical question. Um, sure. Let's say you're saying the Sorrowful Mysteries, right? And you get to the scourging at the pillar, and for whatever reason, it's really hitting home, right? The Lord's really working through that mystery. Do you suggest that you you finish the the tenth Hail Mary? Would you move on to? the third sorrowful mystery, the crowning of thorns, or would you just continue to meditate on that second sorrowful mystery? What a good question. Oh, that's a deep question, man. That's a Charlie yeah. Rose question. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Uh, no, that is such a good question. That's I, I teach a class on campus called Christian Spirituality, and sometimes it's like those questions that become so vital. Um, it's it's staying with the grace okay and the the grace in the moment is uh at the scourging right. the lord is doing something special he's moving in your heart he's uh bringing a deeper affectivity and part of good prayer is just flowing with the inspirations of the spirits mm-hmm. and being docile to them and in that moment, I would recommend just staying with the meditations because that meditation is being used by the Lord in a special way. Um, and you can worry about uh, finishing uh, later right, the, yeah. the other mysteries because sometimes, sometimes your 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 fingers may be stuck on one bead, and you realize you've had your fingers on that bead for 15 minutes hmm. because something has moved you so profoundly, and the meditation is staying with you and it's working interiorly. And in that sense, just allow it to work. Allow allow right. your your soul to rest in it. Yeah, because it's. I think it's the American in me that I'm like, I want to get all five done. You know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I want to say. I want to. <laughs> I want to say all four today, you know, 
it's Check. like it's like no dude don't approach the rosary like a capitalist like what is like what is what are you doing you know you <laughs> hey man hey man Capitalism isn't always Matt, wrong. Matt loves it when his when his question is is the one that that our guest likes the most. That's that's his favorite thing. So yeah. Matt does, <laughs> doesn't just want to take the American approach to the roser. He wants to win yeah. every time he gets on the podcast. Yeah. He's I'm kind of like, like Michael the Jordan in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's the Michael Jordan of, of the podcast right. world right now. And he probably takes it so personally when somebody else's <laughs> question is better. <laughs> yeah, when Father, he gets real upset. I actually have a he picture gets... of Father Sam over here. I throw darts at it every time he asks. <laughs> every time he asks a good question. <laughs> it's just, it's just how he expresses himself. It's, it's yeah. really the Jordan it's Killer Instinct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, as as we're as we're looking at at. The Blessed Virgin Mary and Mary and spirituality. I mean, this is this is obviously very very particular to us as Catholics, and we're, we're often critiqued by by those outside of the the Catholic Church for for being too Marian, for overemphasizing the the role of Mary. Um, I grew up in Stratford, Connecticut, where we have the the Sikorsky helicopter factory, and so the the helicopters uh, there's there's one big bolt that holds the propeller in place, and they call it the Jesus pin. Oh wow. And I would say that's how you can tell they must not be a Catholic company because if they were a Catholic company, it'd be the Mary pin and the smaller <laughs> pin would be the Jesus pin, right? Yeah. But the, <laughs> this this idea of, of like maybe overdoing it with, with Marian devotion, I know that was a thing I struggled with a little bit, especially as I was starting seminary. I was worried that um, I was I was maybe overdoing it with, uh, with, with the Blessed Mother and with devotion to her. And so what I did to solve that problem was I, I bought a new rosary. Uh, and... <laughs> The, the, which is, I mean, it's logical, right? Like yeah. to, to make sure that I wasn't overdoing it on, on Marian devotion, I, I bought a new rosary, and the that that sort of center metal that holds the whole thing right. together, um, instead of being a, a, a Marian medallion or image, uh, it was a Sacred Heart image. Mm. It was it was the Sacred Heart. So I, I said, well, that that way I won't be overdoing it on Mary. Um, and there's this little struggle in me for a while there. Like, I don't really know what's happening. And to be honest, I can't quite pinpoint how that, that struggle eventually went away. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it was it was something, and Father, you can correct me. Uh, on, was, was it Maximilian Colby or was it Louis de Montfort who said, never be afraid of loving Mary too much? Maximilian because you Colby. Can never, yes. was Maximilian Colby, yeah. Yes. Never be afraid of loving Mary too much because you can never love her more than Jesus did. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same maximum. Okay. Yeah. And um, so somebody's coming to you and they're, they're worried that they're overdoing it on Marian spirituality or devotion. Um, what do you say to them? I, I, I say to them that the Lord in his goodness has given us a family. Uh, we have a mother, we have brothers and sisters, the communion of saints and there's nothing wrong with being a mama's boy. There's nothing wrong with loving your mother too much. You know, if that's how you love Jesus, then you are loving him through her. She's mm-hmm. always pointing to her son. You know, Marian devotion, it's part of the public life of the church. It's public revelation. It's the gospel of John, Jesus, from the gospel saying to the beloved disciple, Behold your mother. And John represents every beloved disciple. And then the the passage says, and he took her into his own home. And John Paul II emphasizes that in the original language, there was a deeper meaning here. To take her into your own home meant he took her into his interior life into his spiritual life. So it's right there in public revelation and the gospel and the Bible. And, you know, we all have different personalities, different inclinations. There are people who will be so Catholic, charismatic, that their number one go-to will be the Holy Spirit. There are those who will be so um, attracted to Jesus crucified. There are those who will be so in love with Abba, Father. And there are those who will just 
find God in the most natural way through those maternal hands of Our Lady. Nothing wrong with that. She is the one who leads us to the Trinity. To love her immensely is to give Jesus joy, is to give Jesus honor, because he who honors the Son honors the Mother, and his request is also honored from the cross. His final request before he left from the cross, Behold your Mother. Mm. Yeah, it's great. I love yeah, it. I've never heard um, of it as as honoring Jesus's final request. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite Marian apparition? Oh, you know, because of my uh, conversion, I have a, a soft spot and a great love for Our Lady of Medjugorje. Hmm. Can you correct me if I'm wrong? Um, don't people doubt Medjugorje? Yeah, yeah, they do. There's a long history um, that gets into an ecclesial history. Mm-hmm. Um, so the to be clear, that's not to say that I do. Uh, right, and I and, actually and, think I've read yeah. the book that you mentioned at the beginning. Okay, uh, yeah, was, yeah. Was the guy who wrote it a, a Lutheran? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I read that. Lutheran. That was one of the first books yeah. that I read about Mary that made me want to start saying the Rosary. Yeah, Way amen. Back when yeah. Yeah, yeah, nice. that book changed my life, changed my life. But 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 yeah, it's a it's a good question, Matt, because it's been a long ecclesial history. Um much of the controversy um it originates um in connection to the local bishop uh when the apparitions began, uh Bishop um Zanich, uh Pavel Zanich. Um he was someone who at first was a supporter of the apparitions. And then um, he changed his mind and became a very vocal critic of the apparitions. Mm -hmm. And his criticism um, extended to releasing a document, I believe it was in 1988, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, throughout the world, where he categorized the apparitions as being a case of collective hallucination. And there were uh, influential church leaders who came up to him and challenged him, including the great French Mariologist, Father René Laurentin, who brought teams of scientists and doctors from France to study the visionaries. And he said, the science has showed us that there's no hallucination, there's no pathology, they're not lying, they're passing the lie detector test. Um, Why are you doing this? And it was interesting because with the local bishop, um, there were two theories, two prominent theories that were proposed. Uh, One theory was that the local bishop may have succumbed to communist pressure and communist Mm. persecution because uh, the pastor of the Medjugorje Parish of St. James Parish, Father Yozo Zofko, who defended the apparitions, He was uh, persecuted for that. He was locked up into the Yugoslav uh, prison system where he was tortured. He came out out, uh, nearly, I think, 18 months. He came out deaf in one ear and kind of with a Mm. martyr's reputation for how much he suffered for the apparitions. And it is said that communist um, leaders came up to the bishop and said, if you do not disavow the apparitions, the same thing will happen to you. Uh, shortly thereafter, the bishop went silent on the apparitions for about six months and then started disavowing them. Now, that's one theory uh, why he changed his mind. The other theory is there's unfortunately a long history in that region of conflict between secular clergy and Franciscan clergy. And there was a case where two young Franciscan friars recently ordained Uh, celebrated uh, mass at a parish where the bishop claims they did not have permission and he um, chastised them and he took away their faculties. And um, it is said that the visionaries were asked to um, inquire during their apparition to the mother of God, whether he made the right decision. Um, And one of the visionaries said that they asked Our Lady about this case and that she said that the bishop acted prematurely, that he should uh, reconsider his decision. And the bishop claims that 
it is at that moment that he disavowed the apparitions, that the mother of God would never contradict a bishop, that these cannot be real apparitions of Mary. But what's interesting is that years later, maybe about 10 uh, years later, uh, this case of the two Franciscans uh, came before a Vatican tribunal. And at this Vatican tribunal, it was um, ruled upon that the bishop quote, acted wrongly and illegally, and mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. the apparition was correct in that regards. But um, what happened uh, also, which does, doesn't get reported much, seldom reported, uh, 1986, although the bishop reached, the bishop had a commission that he formed, and he reached a negative conclusion on the apparitions. In 1986, Cardinal Ratzinger, on behalf of John Paul II, uh, met with the bishop in Rome, and he actually chastised him, it is reported, and he asked him to dissolve his commission and to no longer speak about the apparitions, that it's that, that the authority over the apparitions is being taken away from him. And mm -hmm. it was given to a higher conference, the uh, Yugoslav Conference of Bishops. Um, the Yugoslav Conference of Bishops uh, didn't finish their work because of the wars that broke out in the early 90s in the former Yugoslavia. But then in 2010, uh, Pope Benedict XVI formed an international Vatican commission the, on the highest level to investigate the apparitions. And the commission reached a vote 13 to 1 uh, where they decided to... Uh, to support the supernatural character of the first seven apparitions and recommend mm -hmm. that Medjugorje becomes a site where public pilgrimages are allowed. Mm -hmm. And Pope Francis actually acted on that recommendation. He, he lifted the ban uh, off of public pilgrimages. So public pilgrimages are allowed. Even our university now, Franciscan University, is able to take uh, sponsored pilgrimages there. Mm. Um, and so in recent years, uh, Medjugorje has received uh, much more support, much more ecclesial mm. approval than it has been in a, in a long time. So, and a lot of cardinals and bishops have visited. Most uh, One of the most prominent ones uh, in recent years for one of the youth festivals in Medjugorje, there was uh, Cardinal Robert Sarah also mm. visited, mm. gave the homily there, so he was a great presence. Wow. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize that there was this continual escalation of, yeah. of, of people judging it. Yeah, it's it's such it's such a wondrous, you know, ecclesial drama for the yeah. heart of the apparitions. Yeah, I see a TV show. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love a good ecclesiastical drama. Yeah, I mean, yeah, nothing brings in the it. views like ecclesiastical da Vinci dramas. Code meets Marian apparitions. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well. Father Daniel Maria, thank you very much uh, for your time today and joining us. The book is For the Love of Mary. It's available from Emmaus Road Publishing at EmmausRoad.org. Uh, you can also find it through the St. Paul Center um, and and probably that, that other really big bookseller that is online a lot that people like to go to. But um, I'm going to tell you to go to Emmaus Road or to St. Paul's instead. Just go directly to them. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's more fun that way. Uh, Amen. <laughs> Father Daniel Maria Klimek. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Would you, would you uh, end us with a, a Marian prayer for our listeners? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and just thank you again, Fa Father Sam, Matt. What an honor to be with you. Such a joy to talk with you today. It was our pleasure, thank truly. You. Thank yeah. you so much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, our mourning, and our weeping in this veil of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocates, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O most holy Mother of God that we may be, we made, may be made worthy of the promises, promises of, Christ. of Christ. 
And may Almighty God bless you and all our listeners, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, guys.